about art and life as an artist. I'm your host, Bobby Chu. I also have on here my co-host, Xuan Chan. Hey, Xuan. Hey, Bobby. Hey, everyone. And uh, if you caught the latest streams, sometimes we go on to Discord. And this is one of those days. And I got my buddy, Patricia, on there to help organize Discord. Hey, Patricia. Hello. <laughs> Yeah. Wonderful. So you can see on the screen on the bottom left hand corner, you can see where you can join us on Discord, ask some questions live. Today's topic is all about da, 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 productivity, productivity for artists. The mm. other way that you can ask questions because we would like to be productive here, you could go to <laughs> slido.com, hashtag choose stream, and you can ask your questions right there. And then we would be able to answer them if you caught this live right now, if you're on the stream right now. So I want to kind of open up the, um, the first little subtopic to the main topic of productivity. I want to just, just talk about us as people, as humans. We're all kind of creatures of habits. Sometimes I drive home, I get home, and I'm like, how did I even get here? I don't remember. I remember getting in my car. I remember thinking about something maybe I wanted for dinner, and then all of a sudden I'm home. Why? Because habitually I drive to work every day, and there's all these things that you don't really notice because it's just something of habit. You know what I'm talking about, Sean? Yeah, like a routine, right? That's almost ingrained into you that you don't even think about it. Your brain switches off and goes on like autopilot. Yeah, and the whole entire point that I'm bringing up here is that if we are able to create productive habits, habits that we're doing automatically, wow, that really bumps up your productivity like crazy because half the time you don't even realize you're being productive and you're spending your time productively even though you are because it's part of your habits now. Now, mm -hmm. let's flip it around here because I know you guys know what I'm thinking. What kind of habits do we have that are totally not productive as well? Let's be aware of those, right? Mm. Sure. You know what I'm talking about. What's one of the things that, that you habitually do that's not productive? For me, it's um, checking stocks and checking... <laughs> social media it's like i don't need to i don't need to know if some stock went up a tiny bit because i'm not selling it anyways i'm not buying more i don't even know what i'm checking same thing with posts why am i checking for another comment or another two likes it doesn't matter yeah that's that's very true i feel like just to pick one it's difficult but the social media one it, it that's like a big big thing for everybody i think not just for us so here's the tip for everybody. This is something that hopefully will work for you because it's worked for me and so many of the people that I've kind of told this to. So hopefully it'll work for you. Uh, everybody's different though. We're creatures mm -hmm. of habit. Make things that you want to do more of and more often more accessible. And things that you don't want to do less accessible. Right, So if you don't want to go to your phone all the time, when you come home, can you put it in a box? You know, Can you put it by your shoes or something so that you're not going to be getting at it all the time? Now, this might be a tough one because you're constantly maybe communicating with friends through your phone all day, all night, which then you want to question, is that productive? If it's mm -hmm. totally productive, then I guess keep doing it. But if it's like me and if that's not going to be very productive, then you got to break that habit. You got to put that stuff away and people will s soon realize, um, you know what, there's certain times that you call Schwen and there's certain times you don't. <laughs> Now, some people, they might feel like, well, shoot, if I start doing that, then I'm going to lose my friends, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to have such close connections with my friends anymore, and I value that, so I don't want to lose that. Well, the thing is, if you're like 99.9% .9 of the people out there, there's plenty of little places that you can replace little things that you do throughout the day that you can replace with 
messaging a friend. Whenever I'm、mm. waiting, maybe I'm waiting for the bus, I will message、mm. somebody. You know, I'll just start talking with people.、Um, whenever I'm waiting, maybe I'm out with Kay doing Christmas shopping, and you know how much I like Christmas shopping, Xuan.、Uh, <laughs> I don't. I <laughs> yeah, so I'm just texting people, having meaningful conversations, stuff like that.、Mm. Hopefully, that'll help. It was just something that came off the top of my head. I wanted to kind of share it. I remember, Robbie. You used to have like a a little box or something like that where you need like a password or it has a timer, and then like if you go to the gym for like two hours or something, it will unlock. Yes, yes. It's you- actually right by my feet right now. <laughs>、um, what's this thing called? <laughs> Is actually really awesome.、Uh, shoot, I don't see. Oh, it just says kitchen safe. But yeah, what it is is like, it's a box with a timer on it. So you can close the box. You can set it to whatever time you want, and then the box will just lock, and it will not open even if you. Well, you can't even get to the batteries at that point once you close it because the batteries are inside. Um, the only way、mm. to open it is to smash it, which you can、mm. do, you know, if it's an emergency. <laughs>、yeah. But that one's great because you can you can totally put things in there. Like maybe、um, for all the smokers out there, you could put your cigarettes in there, and you could put、mm. the timer till after work, right? And once you know there is no there is no other option, it becomes way easier to resist those vices. So that was a good well, one. What did you used to put inside, Bobby, in this Pandora box? I'm just gonna ask for people out there. <laughs> <laughs> All my vices. I don't know. I don't really use it that much anymore.、Um, mm. But yeah, I really got it as、uh, as a Christmas present idea, but then I just、mm. ended up keeping it because sometimes I'll you know I'll get、mm. a lot of these Christmas ideas. That I don't actually really know who this present is for at the time. I'll do、mm. that like all throughout the year,、um, and sometimes、mm. I keep them. You know, like、uh, the last video I was drawing with this pen that I got in Dublin that had like six、mm. different colors on it. Right, and it's this colorful,、one. yeah, colorful, fun pen, great for kids. I was thinking I'd buy this for a niece or a nephew. And then I ended up just keeping it for myself because I liked it.、Um, <laughs> yeah, and the box was kind of the same thing. I don't even lock it anymore because I don't have anything that I want to lock in there. But it does help a lot. I've done similar things with my、um, arcade machine. I used to have a Terminator Two pinball machine, which was、oh, one yeah, of my. Right? Yeah, you remember that thing. That no, thing is so loud, so loud, so distracting. <laughs> but I loved it, and I would play it all the time, to the point where I wasn't getting work done. And yeah, I am also an animal of habits, big time. When I knew I w- should put it off, I would just keep playing it, and it's so freaking loud. And so finally, I ended up. Opening up my、uh, pinball machine and putting in a big plaster puck I had from some other thing that I was making, I put it inside. I lock it up so you can't play the pinball machine because it has this big object inside. Then you lock it up, and I I put the key away into another box in another room inside another box. So if I want to play my pinball machine, it's you can, but it's difficult. Mm. You know, it just makes、mm. it much harder to do, and then the thing, the things I did want to do, like draw, I would start putting sketchbooks everywhere, pencils everywhere,、mm. everywhere where I might sit down and draw, I'll have a sketchbook very readily accessible. So, and, like creating obstacles towards the things you want to discourage yourself from doing, and then minimizing obstacles on the things that you want to do. More. Yeah, exactly, and put lots of speed bumps in front of the things that you, you want to stop.、Mm. Right, so I wouldn't. It's like if you're if you are a smoker, don't throw out your cigarettes. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying keep your cigarettes fine, 
but put it in a box within a box within a box and put in another room that, you know, and so on and so forth so that you could smoke, but it'll be very uh, difficult. Now, I'm saying this because a lot of times smokers, they'll throw out their cigarettes and then they'll just buy another pack, mm. right? But if you know you have a pack, It'll hopefully stop you from buying another pack. And then hopefully, because it's so cumbersome to try to get to, it'll stop you from smoking as much. It's a good point. Yeah, it's a good point. But, of course, this is all about art, and so you just want to apply that to art. Now, um, why don't we go to a question because we have questions coming in from slido.com and you could go there and you could hashtag chew stream and then you could ask questions live. Uh, the first question here is how to develop a visual library. Now there's many different ways to do this. Obviously you could just copy a whole bunch of images, practice every day. We're talking about productivity here. So what's the best way to be productive when developing a vast visual library. Now, do you, do you practice this at all, Xuan? Mm, not as much as you for sure, Bobby. Like, and definitely not as much as I would love to. But I, I don't I, as I much to, anymore either. I have to be honest. Like, yeah. There's times where I do, and then times where I totally, I'm busy doing other things. But then you're also constantly observing, right? And that's also a good way to build visual library without um, literally drawing or like um, painting. Yes, yes. Uh, I like that you brought that up because I also feel like I can say that all the time, but is it as productive as it could be? I would say no. The best mm. times where I was really expanding my visual library a lot very quickly are times where first take some time to gather some things that you want to learn about, mm. right? So you have a backlog of things that you can learn. Next, just grab one of them. And very like, I don't like to do this. I don't like to just copy things, straight copying but do that, mm. right? Get, try to get every proportion, try to get everything down and try to do it in a way where you're thinking, okay, after this, I have to draw it again without looking at it. And then do mm. that after. Draw it again without looking at it. Then look at it again and draw the mirror image of it, mm -hmm. right? knowing that you're going to have to put it mm -hmm. away and you're going to have to draw the mirror image of it without looking at it again. If both of them turned out really badly, do the process over again. I know it sounds boring, but that's when truly neurons start creating new pathways and you start to learn stuff and you start to create a visual library. When we're just looking, drawing, looking, drawing, comparing, drawing, you aren't actually creating a visual library. You're just trying to get things as close as you can to the thing that you are looking at. Mm. Right, so that's why I would say like uh, it's very boring for many people, but if you wanna be productive, that's what you're gonna do. After that, the next thing that you're gonna study Make sure that it relates to the first thing that you, you studied. Mm. It doesn't have to totally, it, it's like, say you were really studying a pigeon, then maybe mm -hmm. the next thing that you want to study is uh, a crow. Mm. Or mm. if you want, you could perhaps go even further, you could go into a dinosaur, you know, mm. because there's many similarities there as well. But I would, you know, depending on your skill level and depending mm. on your patience, uh, the, most, the most foolproof is you study like one thing and then you study another thing that's very, very similar. And mm, another and another. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And from there, 
you know, like how, well, am I just stuck on furry creatures all the time? No. You know, mm. f furry creatures have very big similarities. Hair has similarities to feathers. Hair has similarities to, to plants a lot of times. Look at grass. You know, and how, mm. does, how does that work? Um, yeah, so there you go. Now on to the next little thing that I wrote down. And by all means, any of you want to just jump in at any time, please do. I encourage it. Um, next thing I wrote down was sometimes we need to learn to cut out or to cut things out and concentrate on what's most important, especially when you're in demand. Okay, I remember why I wrote this. I wrote this last night. Sometimes we need to learn to cut some things out and concentrate on what's most important, especially when you're in demand. Now, this is for all the professionals out there. As you start to develop your skills and all this stuff and people start to notice you, you will go from having zero options to too many options if you're going down the right path. So that's something to look out for is that at a point to be more productive, you got to learn how to say no to a lot of things so that you can concentrate on the things that really matter to you and you can get them to their potential. Mm. Right? Do you, do you ever worry, Bobby, like if you say no and then like the next opportunity wouldn't come again or, you know, if say it's someone that you really, really want to work for, but... At this moment, there's something you want to concentrate on. And um, maybe this director that you want to work with, uh, the project that he's giving you is not exactly what you would love to do. Yes. You know? I used to worry about that. And mm. I think I stopped worrying about it um, after like 10 years of being like that. And mm. I, uh, yeah, that's something that I wish, or I don't wish because everything turned out fine, but... Um, if I was to do things over again and nothing was certain, that would be something I would be very aware of because uh, there was a point where I had too much demand. And this I've, I've talked to a lot of people about and they've had similar situations when they first really start getting noticed. They get, have too much demand and they've always been a person to – be like the person to say, to say yes, and that's why people like them. Can mm. you do this? Yes. Can you do it by this time? Yeah. And then they bust their butts, and then they do it. But say too many people are asking you to do crazy things. You won't be able to do them. You'll do them at a much lower quality, so on and so mm. forth, and things won't go well. That's exactly what happened to me. Um, I took on too many jobs. All of a sudden, I was working on a lot of different projects all at the same time. And I felt like my artwork, ugh, I just wanted to throw up every time I looked at it because I didn't have enough time to work on it and do the things I want to do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, then what's going to happen is maybe some people are going to, you know, do the job with you and then go, yeah, yeah, Bobby wasn't that good. I don't know. Or they do the job with you and then they cut it short because meh, Bobby wasn't that good. You know, either way, it's not gonna be good for you. It's not gonna be a good outcome. Now, I was also afraid, well, what if people don't call me back, right? That's gonna mm. really stink. Um, they still called me back. Mm. You know, if your art is good, you're gonna be in demand. You won't be able to take on everything. People that work with people in demand know this stuff and they will call you back. They will. Just keep doing mm. your thing. Um, here's one. I was on a project where I was like, this is not gelling with me. I don't get it. I don't get what they want. I don't get whatever. So I actually bailed. That's mm. totally different, right? That's even worse. I bailed from the project. I said, you know, I, I'd like to get off of this project. I don't think I'm doing this project any good. Mm -hmm. Now, talk about thinking, oh, my God, are they ever going to call me back? They called me back multiple times. 
so it happens, you know. Just keep your, just keep your uh, art on your A game. Don't dilute it with too many things to do. Mm, dilute it, yeah. That's that's the keyword right there. Yeah. Yeah, totally. All right. So why don't we go on to um, what do we want to do? We have a yeah. Someone is in the chat. Droggy, Droggy, hey. got Droggy. Yes. Hey, Draji. Uh, what's your name? Where are you from? What's your question? Right now, you're, you're on mute. No. Okay. So I'm going to take it as Draji just wants to hang out and, and listen. So we're just going to keep going. Now, I could either go to another question in the... Yeah, let's go to another live question on mm. Slido. Huh? Um, CJ yeah. Rusuto, this person asks, CJ asks, any advice for promoting your art and selling online? Even though I think my art is not good enough and I find a hard time balancing time. So promoting your art and selling it online. What to do there uh, to be the most productive? Because we're also trying to, I'm trying to theme everything towards the main topic here of productivity, right? So mm -hmm. promoting your art and selling online. I, I've noticed that when I put certain posts that are not just strictly art anymore, my followers go down dramatically, <laughs> dramatically mm -hmm. more than when I just put art, right? It's like, this isn't why I followed you. I want to see more of your art, Bobby. Interesting, because I know some people like uh, Loinch, for example, like her Insta stories, right? It's all about her personal life, people who actually wants to follow her as a person yes. on top of her heart. So, like, you know, where is that balance? And uh, how do you play that, you know? One thing I do a bit more of that I've been trying anyways is you know like um, Instagram you can post a carousel of images multiple images and you can swipe so mm. I'll, I'll put the thing that I'm selling not on the first slide you know like here's mm. some art here's some art here's some art by the way all this art I learned it from this class or something like that and it just made it um, I don't know I felt like it made it so much easier for people to engage with it because when people are looking at a post that just looks like a commercial, they don't want to engage with it nearly as much. Now, something that um, happened only within the last bunch of months that I want to explain to everybody is uh, Instagram and Facebook this year, I believe they limited the amount of text that you can see when you look at a post through your mobile device. Have you noticed this, Schwen? Or Patricia, have you Only noticed, like, you what's that? Only after you told me, I started noticing. <laughs> right? So before, you might see, like, four or five lines of text mm -hmm. in an Instagram or Facebook post before it goes dot, 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 more, or whatever that that line is right and then you click on it you could read the whole entire post oh i didn't notice <laughs> right so now you can see less lines and then you see the dot 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 more or whatever it is I, I believe it's that now the thing that people should know is when you click on dot 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 more instagram facebook they recognize that you clicked on that you know, mm. so just like how they look at posts for engagement to see how many people liked it or how many people commented on it, and then that will determine how relevant that ad is. When people click on more, that is also considered engagement. Okay, let's... Uh, also a question uh, yeah. uh, on, the, on the Hangouts. Just say, uh, <laughs> okay. Hi, uh, can you hear my voice fine? Is the volume okay? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, great. Hi. Uh, it's such an honor to be on the stream with you guys. Uh, hi, Bobby. I've been a big time fan. Um, well, long time as well. And Sean. And um, I just want to say hi to all the random citizens out there. I love you guys for making such an awesome art community. I love being part of this community. But Yay. yeah, I have a few questions. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, just to give you a bit of background, I used to be an engineer for about five years in South Africa, if mm -hmm. that explains wow. the accent. Um, and I recently moved to Canada. And <laughs> Oh, no way. It's actually, yeah, yeah, it's actually way harder to transition to be an engineer coming out of an international, I think, experience. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and throughout, I think, about two years of kind of exploration and um, trying to find some kind of network here, I just kind of realized that maybe I really want to transition into art. So um, <laughs> I know it's a, it's a weird like turnout, but I actually have a question for Sean because I know Sean uh, used to be in a um, stewardess, I want to say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For about five years before you became a full-time artist so i really just want to learn as much as i can from people who's traveled this world and uh, maybe you can tell us all your story and what your experience was and you know um what you've learned from there what what would you have wanted to know when you started the journey oh that's that's really interesting because right now you're also doing the transition between engineering and art right so yeah yeah uh, this is this is like kind of I like kind of like a plug-in, but I was flying and then I really wanted to do art, and the only place I know that allows me to fly while learning art is schoolism, so I started taking a lot of schoolism classes, oh. and they started notice <laughs> me, and then I did the in-house workshop, and then uh, I got to meet Bobby and Kay while I was flying. I I did like a New York route. I think, and then I went to New York Comic Con, and that's where I met Bobby. A oh, San Diego Comic Con, actually, and then I met Bobby and Kay, and then it, it's nice to put a face to um, the person that you've admired or the artist that you've admired and respected um, all along, right? And then um, kind of from there, it kind of it kind of went that way, and then eventually, I took enough schoolism classes that um, I redid my entire portfolio. And uh, it got me a few more jobs, some recognition, and uh, and then I got to work with Bobby. Oh, all th all through taking schoolism classes. <laughs> oh wow, <laughs> that's quite a nice plug-in for uh, for schoolism. Yeah. And I, I have to I have to support you in on that because a, a year before I started making this journey, I, I also. Mm -hmm decided to go for the year-long schoolism subscription. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, the job was a bit difficult because there was sometimes I worked, I think, a surplus of 60 hours a week and it was hard to try and fit it in. But wow. I remember waking up in the morning because uh, mm -hmm. uh, Tonko House said it's best to paint in, like, uh, what's the word again? Uh, you know, when light is not direct. So yeah, I would wake paint, up early right? in the morning at 5 to paint something in my... Mm. living room and then go to mm. work <laughs> yeah the golden hour it really yeah. does make a difference you know it really does that's fantastic anything, though thank you is there anything you'd like to add to that Bobby um... uh it's all possible it's all very possible everybody says there's this there's this uh saying that comes to mind with every door closing there's one that opens it's not like one is closing for you you're more like leaving that room yourself uh but then the other part to that saying an addition that i've heard before is like yeah with every door that uh closes one opens but uh walking from one door to the next that hallway can be quite you know quite challenging right um so my main thing with that is f my own tiny little experience that's somewhat similar was that when I was in school, I didn't really look outside. I didn't really look into the industry of who's in the industry, what are they doing, who are all the main kind of players. And that's important um, because just like Schwen was saying, it was really because we got to know each other online and in person. 
mm. that really kind of formed the the friendship and and you know uh, made me feel like yeah I, I want to hire Shwan even though she lives in Singapore you know and she's been with us ever since um, so doing those face to face uh, events kind of thing that is actually quite important and it's not to pedal around your portfolio as much as it is to for people to meet you and to you know see what you're about see what your personality is all about and like meet you on that level uh right. that's what i found anyways because anybody can find anybody's portfolio online they should mm-hmm. yeah i know a few people who have sorry sorry yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say like I've I've known a few artists now who are professional who also made the jump from engineering actually kind of similar to you. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, Andy yeah. Andy Kung, he was a engineer for oh. for a few years, and then he right. made the jump to um, doing art, and, and now he's like storyboarding. Now he's doing all sorts of stuff, uh, working on Netflix, doing very mm-hmm. well. Oh, also, yeah. yeah, Justin Gobi Fields. I forget what he. Oh, he wasn't. He wasn't studying engineering, but he was delivering pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was and, building IKEA discs for uh, for animation studio a few weeks back. I thought that was about as close as I can get at this point. <laughs> That's the thing. Cool. Yeah. Anything, anything um, is absolutely possible, for sure. Yeah, and it, and then, if you mind, if. Uh, this is a second question, actually. It's a follow-up question to what Sean mentioned, um, that she redid her whole portfolio. Yeah. I can definitely uh, kind of relate to that because, I mean, I, my, now that I've got some free time, my art is definitely, I think, improving a lot faster than it used to. Yeah. So it's just like the old art is not up to standard anymore. And um, how long would you say you spent building, rebuilding your portfolio and... How do you compare that the quality is up to scratch with other professionals? <laughs> I wonder how you're going to answer this one, Shwan, because yeah. I know like yeah. you're so self-deprecating and like you're always looking at your stuff going, wow, I don't like it. Yeah, I know. But well, like the jump was really, um, I think we mentioned this before, Bobby. Uh, after taking uh, Jason Zyla's course, it was so drastic that it, it's so clear it's like night and day like before the course and after the course and yeah. um I, yeah and, and I know it's like quite unfair to say to everybody to ask everybody to do this but I I feel like taking the critique classes on schoolism it makes so much difference taking um, that versus the subscriptions like I use subscriptions just for like background streaming while I paint and do my stuff but um the critique sessions they make you really really like put your head down and work hard and and the outcome is just so much more having having especially after you go over your painting again after the teacher uh painted over them right it's it's just like the perfect way to build a new portfolio and i think the course was like two two months bobby two months yeah i'd say so around it. it's around two months mm. it's hardcore yeah so at the it is hardcore. <laughs> you, well, you can be hardcore or you can be lazy about it, right? But of course, true. If you put in that amount of money, you kind of want to go hardcore. And by the end of it, you have you surely have at least ten new paintings. And then now I'm rebuilding it again. Um, like uh, I was telling Bobby, like I'm trying to rebuild it to something less of uh, portraits or caricatures and more of like concepts and ideas. And then I took Tonko's house class, and I have new pieces to add to, to the portfolio as well. So I would say like a few months at least, yeah. Oh, that's excellent. I mean, if I look at your portfolio now, it looks like you've taken Jason Silas' course critique and maybe Tonko House as well. Is there any other courses you can mm. recommend? I mean, they're all good, but um, anything yeah. that you can recommend? Like maybe for someone who's starting off, you know? Well, mm. actually, can I just mention one thing real quick? Sure. A little, because... Uh, I never announced it yet, but Nathan Fawkes just opened up a new course for the subscriptions. So 
you know, you can, with a subscription, you can get access to every course. And we just mm -hmm. added a new one. So if it's cool with everybody, I just want to play a little trailer. Um, plug his course real quick. Of course, yeah, go for it. Hey everybody, Nathan Fowkes here, I don't know how and much it you is time we are bringing my portrait drawing YouTube. class online to schoolism.com. I've taught portrait drawing for many years in the classroom. I've even taught at Disney and other studios, and now I'm so excited to bring the class to you. So in the class, we will learn the tools, the techniques, the principles that will let you observe your subject and create the illusion of life on that two-dimensional piece of paper with a beautiful piece of charcoal. You're gonna love it! Well, maybe not all of it, but that's the point. We're not teaching a formula here. We're gonna give you all the options and show you the possibilities because in all these years of teaching life drawing and working with students, we have made every single mistake possible. And we've had to sit down and figure out what went wrong and why. And you'll be surprised how clear and easy the solutions can be as you find that simple statement that will bring out the light, the shadow, and the personality of your subject. Every week is going to be filled with tutorials, demonstrations recorded live for you, showing a wide range of subjects, approaches, lighting scenarios, and solutions. We're going to get you good at this. And all of you out there, you've been looking for a reason and an opportunity to work on your life drawing chops to turn that moment with your subject into something special and to turn drawing from the frustration that it sometimes is into something you absolutely enjoy. For personalized study with me, where I'll work with you directly, or for a self-study subscription where you can work at your own pace. Join me here at schoolism.com. We're going to do some drawing. I will see you guys soon. So that's a trailer. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to uh, take that myself. Um, portraits is something that I've always loved, but uh, put it down for a good long time now. And uh, recently tried to do a portrait the other day, and it was a struggle. It's like y you can't just pick up a skill and then that's your skill, and you got that forever. You got to kind of maintain it, which is... One of the annoying yet awesome things about art. <laughs> so true. Okay, but thank you so much for answering my questions. Yeah, really looking forward to Nathan Fox. Um, I think he's just, he's so entertaining. He's like, mm. it's like he, he learned how to be entertaining and really like get the information across at the same time. Just, um, yeah, he's just wonderful. One of my artistic yeah. heroes as well. Thank you so much for your question. It was really nice to talk with you. Thank you so much. I'm Michelle. Sorry to not introduce myself at the beginning, but it was really an honor to speak with you guys. Keep up the good work. Thanks, Michelle. Thank Merry Christmas, Michelle. Merry Christmas. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So that was great. Why don't we go on to another question here? Uh, so Noah asks, when you set goals, do you also determine pre... pre parameters oh my gosh listen to me uh <laughs> signs to let you know you're achieving it or on the right path that's a really great one um generally what i do is i kind of look at what i'm doing look at how it's going and think about it you know if you wanted to get to a certain point by a certain amount of time well, how's it going you know, do, do you need to change anything? Do you think that you can get to that level in that amount of time? Now, this can be very scary. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the thing about us is that we underestimate how much we can do in years from now. And we overestimate how much we can do in one year from now. There's been too many conversations, too many 
things that I've heard where somebody goes, yeah, I am currently doing something completely different than art. I'm going to give art uh, a try. And I'm gonna give myself one year to make it, to make it into Pixar, <laughs> you know, to become mm. the next uh, Baby Yoda character designer for ILM. That is a very lofty goal. Mm. If we were able to get there in one year time from nothing, then we wouldn't have to go to school for three or four years, uh, or a lot of the school courses don't wouldn't go on for that much time you mm. can perhaps do that but this is talking about non-stop learning and practicing learning and practicing for like i would say what 15 hours a day Shwan, what do you think yeah that's like you gotta go super hardcore if you have that kind of like high level goals right yeah, one year is extremely, extremely difficult um, if you're going from nothing. That's just reality. But if you want to say, okay, I am dedicating the next three or four years to get to the goal that I want, that actually becomes m much more doable. And if you want to say, yeah, 10 years from now, I will be working on the coolest feature films and, you know, whatever games, that kind of thing. I want to have my own studio making my own games. That becomes way, do way more doable. Mm. Ten years is like... Ten years is like that mark that I feel like there's so little limitations if you're thinking in ten years' times. Mm. So is there like a point, Bobby, where you felt like you have a goal and then that moment where you know that you've met it, that, you know, you can stop pedaling too hard and ride the wave now, you know? Yes, uh, it happened twice. Once mm. when schoolism really started to take off mm. and it was with very little effort, to be honest. I was very much concentrating on films and games and so on and so forth and schoolism just kept growing and growing. That's how you kind of know that, yeah, you're probably on to something. You should probably concentrate on this thing because it's just <laughs> growing by itself. Uh, mm. Yeah, so there's that point. And mm -hmm. once I recognized that point, or once I recognized I was just chilling, just cruising, then I was like, oh, my gosh, I need to spend a lot more time, a lot more focus on this thing because it's important. It's growing all by itself. Uh, mm -hmm. It needs some care. The other time is right now, actually, because Lightbox Expo was such a big kind of goal for me. Um, mm -hmm. Now I've been wondering, what is my next big, you know, 10-year goal? I don't really have one right now, but I am looking for it. It's mm -hmm. not something that you want to, you know, take lightly and just commit your next 10 years to super quick. You know what I mean? Yeah, we only have like around nine of those, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, man. <laughs> <coughs> and we have a... <coughs> sorry, we have a caller uh, on yeah. Discord. Hey, caller. What's your name? Mm -hmm. Where are you from? Uh, sorry, um, Sino is fine. I <laughs> am from Virginia, and I had a question about preparing for conventions. I have been kind of on and off with my art because I've been getting a job outside of school. I've been off of school for like a year, but I want to give myself a goal for really getting back into uh, being productive with my art. So I was thinking of making maybe one or two merchandise pieces for a con that's in May of next year. And I was wondering if you had any advice on preparing for that. Yeah, generally I like to have something that's free uh, that I can give out that isn't that hopefully isn't totally about promoting yourself um, mm -hmm. and I have the stuff that I want to sell uh, and the stuff that I want to sell I want to make sure that's visible you know so if it's just flat on my table that's not really that visible as opposed to having it 
upright, at least you know one or two samples. Uh, that's pretty standard. It's pretty um, self-explanatory. But the thing where I was saying, have something free that you can give to people. For me, that's my business card. Now, obviously, a business card, that's very much promotional. However, the way that I design my business card, one side is nothing but the image itself. There's no writing on that side. And I'm thinking about it in terms of almost like a trading card. You know, so I have multiple different kinds of business cards, all with multiple different images on there. And even though I don't say that they're trading cards, it almost screams, these are kind of like trading cards. And you see especially kids come up and just grab all of them, one of each. And many, many producers that have come by the table will do the same thing because they want to show their, produ their director or their producer friends, um, oh, check out this artist, right? And they have this mini little portfolio in, in their hands already. Uh, that's always worked extremely well. And you could do this with things like stickers, uh, with stamps, with, you know, something free that people can give out. Maybe your thing is a little mini, I don't know, puzzle. When they piece it together, they piece together your business card on the other side as well. I don't know. Does that help, Sino? Definitely. Thank you, Bobby. And thank you, Troy. You guys are really great. Wonderful. Um, well, our pleasure. Our pleasure. Why don't we go on to another uh, question here? So this question is from Anonymous, and this person asks, I've just started my career as a character designer, but my personal work looks better than the work I do for the client. Can you give some thought about it? Here is one super simple, very effective tip. Go over your commercial work. Say you, you had your deadlines, whatever. You wish you could have had another hour or two hours onto the thing that you submitted. Go over it for another hour or two hours and then put it on your site. Mm, that's 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 a, like a, such a good point, Bobby. You know, like only recently I learned that, you know, all the beautiful artwork that I see in those out of books, I, f I only found out recently that those were not the real production pieces. Like they actually, after the deadline, they took it down and then they repainted it like on top of it and spent more time on it. And then they put it in the out of books. So like most of the stuff we see in the out of books are not like what they handed in to clients, you know, they polished it. Wow, that's so funny. I actually, I didn't know that. Um, but then again, I've only been in one art of book and that was like, for Alice in Wonderland, they did publish the stuff that we handed in, but then mm -hmm. I'm not, I wasn't there to have that option. You know what I mean? By the time they're mm -hmm. making the book, I'm like six projects yeah, removed. Project. Yeah. Yeah. But that's interesting. And that makes perfect sense. You're going to publish something. Why don't you polish it? Because when you're making a film, it's all about uh, more about the idea if it's conceptual, it's more about the idea and it's more about getting that stuff out there, you know, real snappy like. Um, mm. Yeah. That's very interesting. Why don't we go on to another little, next little blurb I wrote down, okay? I like this one. Uh, this is more, I think this is more of an advanced one, I think, for productivity. You don't always have to look for opportunities. We can also concentrate on making opportunities. Now, that could feel a bit more advanced for some people. Like, how the heck am I supposed to make an opportunity happen? But you can. Um, I think one very simple example from ground zero, from nobody knowing anything about me, was doing subway sketching, right? I just started doing subway sketching, creating an opportunity for myself because I couldn't get a job. I couldn't get a teaching gig either because for a lot of teaching jobs, you need to have experience teaching. Well, how can you 
get experience <laughs> teaching if you always need experience yeah. teaching, right? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So I started teaching yeah. on the subways, and then I just put it online, just saying, hey, anybody want to meet me on the subways of Toronto? Come meet me. We'll sketch together. If you want to learn from me, I'll be happy to teach you for free. Mm. That is one very clear example of making opportunities happen for you instead of just looking for them, waiting for them. Uh, another huge one, of course, is again, it's Lightbox Expo. I always want to have a place where it was very much about artists, by artists, artists uh, organizers that really understand the art community. I didn't see that anywhere. So then I got my buddy Jim Donakos together with me and and we formed a team and we created Lightbox Expo. Mm. So there's always possibilities. Schoolism is another huge one. I couldn't find an online art school. Right? This is before Facebook back in the day. So instead of waiting around for one, you know, we made one. Mm. This brings back memories about your book, The Perfect Bait Bobby. Nice, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I I've... remember you saying that Tim Burton job. I, that always stuck with me, how you kind of like started creating certain works that you know would uh, attract his attention and, you know, it, it, tol it totally worked, you know, how you tailored your portfolio. It's kind of like creating opportunities like you're saying, right? But in a professional industry level. Yeah, uh, that, that was very conscious, definitely. Um, mm. If you want to work on Star Wars, start painting some Star Wars stuff. You know, it's not like a bunch of fan art with the same storylines as mm. the, the movie that just came out or something. But make up your own storyline. Make up your own little sub-universe of Star Wars and start painting that. Mm. Anyhow, uh, Joji has come on. I don't know if this person has a question or not, but feel free to speak up if you do. Hey, Joji. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Is my mic bad? Like last time it was like <laughs> messed up. No it's worries. Funny. No worries. Where are you from? Um, Canada. I'm in ah. Ottawa. Oh, Ottawa, right on. Well, I hope you're staying warm. Um, what's your question? Um, I wasn't really sure because, like, with the whole productivity thing, um, I re I look back at my old sketchbooks from last year because, like, I'm in, I'm in high school and mm -hmm. I'm in grade 12 right now, and I realize I've done much more drawing the earlier years, and now I'm doing less. But I just, it also sucks because I want to do more personal work for like my portfolio, mm -hmm. but I'm just not really feeling motivated at all. So a thing to help that kind of I got with some friends and doing draw fest right now. And also I got schoolism for a year, so maybe that'll help. But yeah, um, you know, like a lot of times that's the biggest battle, right? is just against yourself. It's against that voice in your head that's telling you to do other things. It's questioning, you know, once you come up with that idea, hey, maybe I should draw now. That voice in your head comes up and it's like, should you? Should you? I don't know. It's all the way over there. I don't know. <laughs> right? Yeah. And a lot of times, that's the battle we have to have. We gotta, we gotta say, hey, listen, voice. I'm in control here. You know, you're supposed to listen to me and and uh, get control of that voice. And that is such a powerful thing, Joji. That's something that hardly anybody really does and gets a handle of. And it's a battle throughout our whole entire lives. But um, the more you can totally have control of your willpower and have control of that, the more practice you do, uh, the more successful you become. It's like we can, it, when you think about it, it's like everybody you know, we all have 
that ability to become successful in whatever facet, whatever way we want. It's just the decisions that we make and, and how we react to the things that happen to us that determines like 99% of this. Yeah. Mm. The great thing is you are young. You are in high school. You got, you know, decades ahead of you. So that whole entire thing of, um, you know, when I was saying, what's your 10-year goal? Create a 10-year yeah. goal. Create a 10-year goal, Droji, and make yeah. it nice and big and shiny because you, you do have all of the potential in the world right now and, and you have the most powerful thing, which is time. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's one of my goals for like next year, 2020, because like I've been building it up so I don't have to start completely new in that year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been going well. And like, I'm just, also I haven't been really taking care of myself. So that's probably why I'm not feeling motivated to, <laughs> to do anything. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you know, know that you have to sharpen your pencil at some time. You just can't keep drawing and drawing. You got to take care of yourself. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. The whole, like, sharpening your pencil. Anyways, I meant for that to be. I meant that metaphor, yeah. That's a good yeah, one. you know. All right. Well, thank you so much for your question, and uh, I wish you the you. best of luck. Thanks. Yeah, good luck. And, and you're very talented, Jogi. I saw your Instagram. Oh, uh, thank you. you. Oh, <laughs> right on, right on. All right. Got the stamp of approval from Patricia. <laughs> Excellent. All right. A couple last little things I wanted to mention here uh, that I wrote down. I want to mention always think about why you're doing something, even if that's how everyone is doing it. This is something I would want to like underline, emphasize, highlight, because it's something that we don't do even, even more now. This is something that we don't do. Why? Because anytime we don't know how to do something, what do we do? We look it up, right? You know, mm. like, oh, my sink is broken. What do you do? <laughs> you look up how to fix it. Hopefully you do that one. It's probably uh, cheaper. <laughs> right? But say, I don't know how to digital paint. Then you're going to look up how do you digital paint, and you're going to follow that person and whatever. Um, maybe that person doesn't have the right idea, and then you follow it without questioning it. I'm not saying don't follow it. I think you should try it. You should follow it. If it makes sense to you, try it out. But as you're trying it, question it. Question what I'm saying. Question what I'm doing. If it doesn't make sense to you, keep questioning it even more. If you question it and it does make sense to you, then you should do it. Because too many times we know the right thing to do, but we just don't do it. And that's the biggest problem. You know, sometimes we will look something up and we go, okay, that's how we should do it. You don't question it, you build on it. And then somebody else looks up, well, how do you do this? And then they find your solution that's built on, on top of a, a base of inaccuracy, of not the best way to do things. And then they build on top of that and then so on and so forth. You know, what's a great, horrible example of this is like coal somebody figures out let's burn some coal okay there's energy and then the next person's like look what else i could do with this energy i can make it into an engine and i can make combustion or whatever and so on and so forth right all of a sudden using up this resource that's polluting the air and nobody's really sitting there and going hmm should it be different Mm. That's a more extreme example, but you get where I'm saying what I'm saying with this. There's been so many times where I sat there and just thought about it and just keep thinking about it. Of course, for me, a lot of those situations was because the internet was so much in in its infancy that you couldn't really do anything with it yet. There were no answers. Uh or I just didn't have the internet or I went through that experience and now I I appreciate sitting there and try to think about it for myself and try to think about a new solution. Because when you do that, that's when you have the biggest opportunities
for evolution, the biggest opportunities to go way beyond uh, where everybody else is or where the world is right now. You know, it's like making those leaps like the iPhone all of a sudden just changes everything. Uh, yeah, so that's why I also want to uh, mention this because if you make that habit and then you, you kind of key into a new way of doing things, a new style, a new method, whatever, wow, you just became real productive with your time going light years mm -hmm. beyond. It's like mindfulness almost. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes, and but also just like not taking the answers that we already have mm -hmm. as the be all Please. end all of answers. You know what yeah, I mean? Just learning different ways how to do one single thing. That's beautiful. And then through that, mm -hmm. perhaps also keep your mind open for a completely new way, your way. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. All of them together. Well, I want to thank Droji and all of the uh, all the people tuning in and all the people that ask questions for tuning in. And I want to thank uh, Patricia and Schwen for hanging out with me on the streams. And uh, yeah, big Merry Christmas, Hanukkah, everything. Happy holidays mm -hmm. to everybody. Nothing but positive <laughs> thoughts. All right, everybody, take care. And uh, don't forget, so Schoolism subscription sale, it's a huge one. And it ends January 16th, 2020. See you guys next time. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.